Good morning. Welcome to live online worship with St. James Episcopal Church in Skinny Atlas, New York. Today, the music is led by Director of Contemporary Music and Technology, Michael Larkin, and members of St. James Worship Band. We are also blessed this morning to have the Reverend Dr. Jim Coral preaching the first time since the beginning of the pandemic that he has been in this pulpit. We do love seeing your names and chatter throughout the service if you are with us on Facebook, so please do post if that's your style. And there is a bulletin for today's service that is on St. James' website at stjamesscan.org. We invite you now to prepare your hearts and minds for worship. You turned into wine Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is great stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. None like you. Our God is greater. God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God, and if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us, and if our God is with us, then who can stand against, and if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us, and if our God is with us, then who could stand against. Stand against Our God is greater Our God is stronger God you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome in power God Our God Our God is greater Our God is stronger find ourselves this Sunday morning or throughout the rest of the week, help us to remember that you are greater, you are stronger than anything that could stand against us in this time or any other. Amen. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain.
Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Keep, O Lord, your household, the church, in your steadfast faith and love, that through your grace we may proclaim your truth with boldness and minister your justice with compassion for the sake of our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord accomplishes great things that surprise the human heart. It is often through unexpected means that God's glory is revealed to the people. A reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of a cedar. I will set it out. I will break off a tender one from the topmost of its young twigs, I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain height of Israel, I will plant it in order that it may produce boughs and bear fruit and become a noble cedar. Under it, every kind of bird will live in the shade of its branches will nest winged creatures of every kind. All the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. I bring the low, I bring low the high tree, and I make high the low tree. I dry up the green tree, and I make dry, I make, excuse me, I make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will accomplish it. The word of the Lord. Psalm 92, verses 1 through 4, 11 through 14. It is a good thing to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. To tell of your loving kindness early in the morning and of your faithfulness in the night season. On the psaltery and the lyre and to the melody of the harp. For you have made me glad by your acts, O Lord, and I shout for joy because of the works of your hands. 
The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree and shall spread out abroad like a cedar of Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall bear fruit in old age. They shall be green and succulent, that they may show how upright the Lord is, my rock, in whom there is no fault. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow, he does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. He also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when grown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. God be in my head and in my understanding. God be in my eyes and in my looking. God be in my mouth and in my speaking. God be in my heart and in my thinking. God be at my end, at my departing, through Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Jesus said, the kingdom of God as is if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day and the seed would sprout and grow, he does not know how. In August of 1963, while I was a student at Syracuse University, I attended a weekend retreat for the leadership of a group of Episcopal leaders of ministry on campus. Its purpose was to help members of the group get to know each other and to plan out the church's ministry on campus for the 1963-1964 school year. It was a very fruitful weekend, especially for me. I did not know it when I attended, but my life would be changed forever by something that happened that weekend. <clears throat> you see, it was that weekend that I met a young sophomore nursing student 
named Nancy Duckett. While there were a few stumbles along the way in getting that relationship started, it was the beginning of a three-year courtship that has led to now 55 years of marriage, three daughters, three grandchildren, seven great-grandchildren, a lot of laughter, some tears, but a lot of good history. And I can tell you truthfully that meeting Nancy Duckett was the best thing that happened to me in this life. Her influence on my life changed me for the better. Not all at once, to be sure, but step by step. Back in those days, you see, I was a city boy dating a country girl whose father was not too sure about me because I was a city boy. I was a hard-nosed intellectual so far up in my head that I thought of emotions as the source of all weaknesses in human life. And here I was dating a true romantic. Over the years, Nancy's influence on me brought a very healthy balance to my life that likely would not have happened except for her. I am so much a better person today, and I had had so much a better, more productive, ordained ministry than I would have had had, it, had I not met her. Back in those days, she knew the Bible better than I did and had a stronger faith than I did. And the truth is, that may still be true today. The interesting thing is that the change in me came about in small steps over a long period of years. Life events contributed to that change, to be sure, but I must give full credit to Nancy for much of what has come out of me that has been good. God has blessed me through her, and I mean every word of that. I suspect that those of you who have had long marriages or who have had deep friendships uh, that have lasted for many years know exactly what I'm speaking about. Because important relationships have a profound impact on the people we become over time. Now please hold that thought in mind because I'm going to come back to it in a few minutes. Not, not unlike us today, people in Jesus' day had some very clear expectations about what they thought God was up to. One of those expectations was that God would restore the kingdom to Israel to use his own disciples' words. By that, they meant that they expected that at some point, God would restore their nation to be like it was in the days of David and Solomon. All of the prophets, despite the complaints they had against Israel, spoke of a day of restoration promised by God. So it is not surprising that even after 500 years living under a series of foreign nation states, People would vision the future with images from the past. They were not the first, nor were they the last people to do that. And as a matter of fact, growing impatient in the 130 years after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, they tried at least twice to force that to happen with disastrous results. It is never a good thing to try to force God's hand. The point here is that kingdom of God talk was in the air around Jesus. When would it happen? What would it look like? How would it begin? What would be the signs that it was about to arrive? Kingdom expectations became a matter of considerable importance even, even at the time of Jesus' uh, crucifixion. You can hear it in the conversation between Pilate and Jesus. To the Romans, the very idea of the restoration of Israel or the idea of, of, of a king of Israel was a serious matter, one that they had to take seriously, and they did. It was the charge on which Jesus was rendered the death penalty. So it is important in this context to examine carefully the way that Jesus himself talked about the kingdom of God. He knew the popular expectation, to be sure, but he avoided speaking about it in those terms, except at one point, the very moment 
that he ascended back to his father in heaven after his crucifixion and resurrection, his apostles asked him, will you now restore the kingdom to Israel? You can almost imagine what went through Jesus' mind at that moment. It was like, haven't they gotten the point yet? His answer was very clear, very clear, crystal clear. Only the Father knows the days and times. The implications? You will not know it. So he warns them not to speculate. Would that Christians over the centuries might have heard that more clearly. Jesus, however, did talk about the kingdom of God, just not in the terms that people expected. When he talked about it, he used parables and images that described something very different from what people expected. He said things like, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is like a pearl of great price that you, that you go and work hard to be able to obtain. The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and the seed would sprout and grow. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, very tiny, but it grows into something magnificent. Jesus pictured the kingdom, the realm and lordship of God in this world as primarily an interior state, one that would transform those in whom it was planted and through them transform the world in which they lived. His images described a kingdom that would grow slowly and mysteriously, not unlike a seed planted in the ground. Which now brings me back to my opening remarks about the impact that important people have on our lives. Seems to me quite apparent that Jesus, through his life and teaching, reached out generously to people around him. Good people and bad people. People who were liked and people who were not liked. Sick people and well people. Religious people and non-religious people. He openly invited them in, invited them to a deeper and deeper relationship with him. And through him, to a profound relationship with the living God, the God who is love, who is holiness, who is forgiveness, who is life. Jesus, I think, did not expect explosive changes in people's lives, though he knew that could happen. Think about St. Paul. Rather, he expected that as people tended to their new and growing relationship with the living God, that something would happen within them, that the fruit of life, love, forgiveness, generosity, inclusion, all of that would shape them and change them through that relationship they had, change them into something quite new and transformative to the world that they lived in. His images of growth regarding the kingdom of God strongly suggest that expectation. We hear a lot today about the second great commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, and rightly so, as well we should, is extraordinarily important. It speaks to the mission of the people of God. But sometimes I think we do not hear enough about the first great commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. The second great commandment rests in the cradle of the first great commandment. The believer's task is not just to be a do-gooder, but to be one who shares the very love, holiness, forgiveness, life, generosity of God himself. That kind of life has the ability to change the world we live in, and boy, do we need that. So here's the challenge for us, for you and for me. God has invited you and me into a profoundly deep relationship with him. He invites us to nurture that relationship daily through prayer and through an honest and open life with him. He invites us to plant our relationship with him in our very souls like a seed and then to tend it, to water it, to do whatever is necessary to provoke its growth. And it will grow if we do that. Its growth may be imperceptible to us at times. As Jesus said, 
He would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. That process of kingdom growth will surely happen slowly, day by day, little by little, if we plant it and nurture it. And in the process, it will make us into different people than we might otherwise have been. People whose very lives slowly become a presence of God in the midst of our world. And this is the kind of life that God wants of us, needs of us, calls forth from us. A life of holiness, forgiveness, love, life itself, generosity, inclusion. It has the power to change the world, to reshape it into a new kingdom, the reign and rule of God, beginning with us. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar. I will set it out. I will break off a tender one from the topmost of its young twigs. I myself will plant it in order that it may produce boughs and bear fruit, and all the trees shall know that I am the Lord. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will accomplish it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God has taken the initiative to invite us into relationship and all that God has done first and all that God offers is summarized in the words of the Nicene Creed. I invite you to stand and let us say these words together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. In our diocese, we pray for our bishop, the Right Reverend Dr. Dee Dee Duncan Probe, and the people of St. Paul's Episcopal Church, Endicott, and their priest, the Reverend John Martino Chio, and the people of Afatha, Endicott, oh, Mission, I'm sorry, the people of Afatha Mission Chapel of the Deaf, Deaf, and their priest, the Right Reverend Williams. In our companion diocese, 
we pray for the people of San Juan Evangelista San Salvador and their priest, the very Reverend Louis Sereno. In the Episcopal Church, we pray for our presiding bishop, the most Reverend Michael Curry, and the people of the Diocese of Louisiana and their bishop, the right Reverend Morris K. Thompson. And in the Anglican Communion, we pray for the people of the Church of Nigeria and their bishop, the most Reverend Hen Henry C. Nadugupa. Equip us with the compassion and love to carry out your work of reconciliation in the world. God of love. God of freedom, we pray for our nation and all the nations of the world, for peace and unity across barriers of language, color, and creed, for elected and appointed leaders that they would serve the common good. Unite the human family in the bonds of love. God of freedom. God of justice, we pray for, your, for the earth, your creation entrusted to our care. Stir up in us a thirst for justice that protects the earth and all its resources, that we may leave our children's children the legacy of abundance that you have given us. God of justice. God of peace, we pray for this community, for our schools, neighborhoods, and workplaces. Give us courage to strive for justice and, equal, and equality among all people, beginning here at home. God of peace. God of mercy, we pray for all in any kind of need, for refugees and prisoners, for the sick and suffering, for the lonely and those who mourn, and for those we now name. Awaken in us compassion as we seek and serve Christ in all persons. God of mercy. God of grace, we pray for those who have died, for those lost to the pandemic, for military personnel and public servants who have given their lives in service to our nation, and for those we name now. God of grace, hear our, praise, our prayers, holy God. Breathe your spirit over us and all the earth, that barriers would crumble and division cease. Make us more fully your co-healers of the broken world. Unite us with all people in bonds of love, that the whole earth and all its peoples may be at peace through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Welcome again to all of those who are worshiping this morning online. It's wonderful to be with you. We do have a congregation present here in the church. And at least for the time being, we're asking folks to register online if you come to this 9 a.m. service. Although we have not been at capacity yet, and so it may be that we'll be able to lift that uh, soon, that requirement to register online. Today, we begin outdoor worship in the park for the first time uh, in two years, uh, all the way in the park, actually. Uh, we have changed the time slightly to 1045 in order to accommodate all that needs to happen between the services. There is no registration for that service. Uh, Y'all just come. We have a pastoral letter this morning from our bishop, uh, the Reverend Dr. D.D. Duncan Provey, about... COVID restrictions and worship, and I am simply going to read that letter to you. Dear friends, since the COVID-19 crisis began over 15 months ago, our congregations have walked together hand in hand. We have covenanted together, promising to protect the vulnerable, to extend Christian hospitality, and to seek God's transforming love and changing circumstances. We have learned so much over this past year, and guided by our shared values, we are now ready to take the next step in our journey together. Beginning Saturday, June 19th, 2021, each congregation will have local discretion to establish COVID-19 response guidelines within the restrictions established by New York State and in line with recommendations from the CDC. I trust our parish leaders and the faithful people of this diocese. I believe that parish leaders will make decisions that reflect our shared commitment to the safety and well-being of all by responding faithfully to the realities of the local congregation and community. 
protection of the most vulnerable, and connection with those unable to attend worship and church activities in person remain our priority. The diocese will continue to provide resources to assist parish leaders in making decisions at the diocesan website. In this diocese, we have not had a single COVID-19 spreader event. I am deeply grateful to every Episcopalian, especially our vestry leaders and clergy, for your tender care of God's children through this crisis. Together, may we continue to act in ways consistent with our vision of a world healed by love. Blessings of peace for the journey. Bishop Deedy. So we will, our, our reopening task force continues to try to think through uh, what the realities are that, that are peculiar, particular to this location, and we will continue to open as we are able. Uh, Laura Pesesnik continues in North Carolina with her parents, helping her dad recover from serious back surgery. She is not in the office, and so she will be taking longer than her usual speedy self to handle your requests. And finally, I want to uh, thank Jim Corll for preaching this morning. It's just wonderful to sit at your feet uh, again, Jim. And interestingly enough, I think your sermon was a perfect segue for the announcement that I am about to make, which is that, so, so Jim talked about the importance of tending to our relationship with God across our entire lifetime, and that that is the cradle of our ministry and our service and our care of neighbor in the world. I'm going to invite uh, Marie Hughes and Pam and Michael to come up, if you will, to the lectern. Marie, at the, at the age of 80, ma made the decision to begin the process of, study of studying and preparation to become a novice so you, you, you come up here and c come on up. We're, we're all vaccinated, so we're, it's okay. Um, to become a novice in the Companions of St. Luke, which is an, an Anglican order of the Benedictines. And in fact, Pam and Michael are also in the preparation process to take vows and to um, live a life that is ordered by prayer and um, those vows that you will be taking. So the, the, these are living examples right here of people who are doing exactly what Jim talked about and taking very seriously their own life as disciples of Jesus. Marie is going to get on a plane this afternoon and go to Concession. Conception Abbey in Missouri, where she will be clothed as a novice and receive her religious name. And when she returns to us, so this is a dispersed order, which means they don't, they don't live uh, in one location. They live all over, literally all over the world. And so Marie will return to us uh, for her continued life of uh, faithful service and ministry. And we're going to... We're going to send off Pam and Michael as well when their time comes to um, take their vows. And we have talked about having them uh, be a, converse, a sermon conversation at some point so that you all might understand a little bit better about what it is that they are doing and what's available to you, in fact, as well. So we're going to lay hands on Marie here. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful that in every generation you continue to raise up faithful servants who know you and love you, worship you, make their life a life of prayer and service and devotion. We pray, Lord, that you'll keep Marie safe, that you will calm her beating heart, and that you will bring her back to us full of joy. And we do pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I have, I have a few, uh, a handful of birthdays that I want to mention before we say the birthday blessing. 
Uh, Hope Allen it's had a birthday when? Yesterday. Yesterday. Lin Linda Lavery last Monday. Braden Taggart, Joyce Berry, and um, Evie Barkley over this particular weekend. And so if you would join me in saying the words of the birthday blessing. May the strength of God pilot you. May the power of God preserve you. May the wisdom of God instruct you. May the hand of God protect you. May the way of God direct you. May the shield of God guard you against the snares of evil and the temptations of the world. And may the spirit of God bless you in the coming year. And I invite you now to stand and let us say the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I do want to ask the congregation that's present in the church to stay through the closing music. I have a couple of things to share with you in particular about in-person worship at St. James, so if you would just be seated again at the end of the service. May the heavens bless you May the sun shine on you. May the rain dance on your upturned face. May the stars make you wonder and smile. May the bounty and beauty of the earth bless you. And may you bless the earth in planting and protest and sharing food. And may God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer bless you now and forever. Amen. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray, unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. church we need your power in us we seek your kingdom first we hunger and we thirst refuse to waste our lives for your our joy and prize to see the captives hearts release the hurt the sick the Yeah. 
Go now. Go and revel in God's world. Go and be creative. Go and work for justice. Go and love your neighbors. Go and walk with God. Amen. Alleluia. Amen. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia. Build your king.